So I'll be speaking in really medieval long case and other features at Palmyra Quarry. Um, just a bit of a background to the site. So we were commissioned by Breeding Aggregates back in September and uh, between September and December 2021 uh, to undertake a topsoil strip uh, prior to graveling and sand extraction. Um, for those of you who don't know Palmyra Quarry, because why would you? It's to the southeast of Kirimir. So Kirimir is up here. And it's just to the south west of it and to the, uh, to the north west of uh, Glams as well. So the area was previously used as farmland. And so from this picture here, so this is our site on this sort of hill here. So it rises up um, to the north and it's a south facing hill. Um, and there's a small sort of plateau just around the middle section here. And then it flattens off where the machine is right at the top. So this is a, so Palma itself lies in a landscape of a regular hummocks of glacial material that provides the sand and gravel sought by the quarry. The local place names include Palmyra and areas around it, such as Moss End and Lockside, all point towards a landscape of plateaus separated by areas of bog. The higher points of this land was obviously the areas that were occupied. So a quick overview of the previous areas of work. Um, so this is phase six of the quarry site so far. So down in the bottom corner here, um, this is work undertaken by Headland in 2006. And so they identified a number of timber structures a couple of roundhouses, four and eight post structures. And they also identified a few small clusters of long kiss, one section here, here, and here. And we'll have a look at those in a bit more detail as well as they will relate to our site. Our site at the minute is just in preliminary stages. We've just excavated it. Um, the post excavation work will start next year and the publication will ensue as well. Um, so phases two and four and five up here, they just identified a spread of isolated pits and clusters of pits. Um, nothing too interesting or anything we could learn from it really. And area three over down in the southeast corner identified three um, curvilinear enclosures, which are assumed to be animal enclosures. So it's obviously a rich landscape of prehistoric activity um, and also some early medieval activity as well. Um, and so our site, which we're looking at, is down over here. So a quick overview of what the archaeological features that were found, and um, we'll go into more detail into them afterwards. So down on this sort of small plateau in the southeast, this is where our sort of um, Bronze Age settlement, uh, with a number of small roundhouses and also uh, two other further possible structures as well. The early medieval cemetery um, was identified in two areas. So there's a large cluster of 22 uh, kists in this bit and two isolated kists at the top up here. There's also a spread of uh, nine elongated ditches, um, nine elongated pits, which are spread around the site, focused primarily around the settlement area, and we'll have a look at those. The only other structural element was a possible wing ditch um, over here to the west of the settlement. And then, of course, numerous isolated, isolated in groups of pits. The uh, post-medieval agricultural activity is seen in the form of a single field boundary, which extends all the way this way, and these green marks will represent agricultural furrows as well. So we're going to be talking about the um, features in um, date order, to be honest. So timber-built structures. So as I said, these were on the um, sort of small plateau on the eastern edge of the site. Um, the largest one is this one over here um, on the west. Um, and this is what the picture is showing here. So we've got a clear arc of our uh, post holes a small sort of uh, gully as well. Uh, it was 11 meters in diameter. There's a possible um, entrance to the southeast, but we're not quite sure, and it's, we need to look into it. These structures are where we found most of the pottery from the site. Most of the isolated pits, we didn't find any material evidence from them at all. Um, slightly to the southeast is um, the second roundhouse, which is smaller. Um, there's obviously a lot of rebuilding because a lot of these pits intercut one another. You can't quite see um, on this plan. And it cuts through an earlier elongated pit here. There's also a possible internal division as well. So in the top northeast here, we have a possible third uh, structure, rectilinear, uh, rectilinear structure. Um, it's also quite small and there's also evidence of reese as well. So as I said, we're in the preliminary stages, but because of the work undertaken in 2006 by Headland Archaeology, which is, they identified also further structures directly to the east of it. And they radiocarbon dated two of their structures to between 1120 and 820 
BC, placing it within the late Bronze Age. And the initial analysis of the pottery from these roundhouses sort of matches that sort of data. So that's what we're looking at here. Uh, the other possible structure that we found on site was a possible ring ditch, but it was very heavily plow truncated and only 23 centimeters deep. And it'd been a very small ring ditch as well because it's only five meters in diameter. Um, no other evidence was retrieved from it, but there was um, charcoal throughout it, which will also be radiocarbon dated. And hopefully we'll get back some answers. Looking at these elongated pits, these are quite an interesting uh, thing which wasn't found in the previous works. So they were spread around across the site, but focused primarily around the structures over here. So most of them were sort of this sort of straight elongated pit, but some of them also had a sort of a curving aspect to them as well. Uh, they had quite straight sides, and it was the theory of a minute that they were possible storage pits. However, because of the gravel, the natural gravels, we were there for about two months, and by the end, the sides all already collapsed in just naturally. So if it were open for a longer period of time, it would have had to be timber lined. We didn't actually get any sort of material evidence in terms of pottery or anything from them. Um, and so we're not quite sure what they are at the minute. Moving on to the early medieval longists, as I said, they were found in two clusters, this large cluster to the south here, cluster B, and this isolated two ones in the top, cluster A. So this is placing it next to the 2006 work from Headland. Um, they identified three sections, three areas with long kists in them. Uh, but they only had clusters of four, uh, four here, three kists here, and a single isolated one down here. So this whole area is on a natural ridge, and also a plateau at the top. It was the highest point of the site was where these kists were found. They were all very similar form to the Headland archaeology ones as well, um, which should be radiocarbon dated between the 6th and 7th century AD. So we are also assuming at the minute um, that we have the same sort of date range. So looking at cluster A, this had our best surviving kist. Um, it was best surviving because it was the deepest. The rest of them have all been very heavily plow truncated. And it was the only one with surviving capping stones, which you can see in this bottom left hand corner. There was a small sort of opening in the um, capping stones where it probably had just fallen through. And you can see in this picture on the right where the soil has obviously entered into the kist. It's probably led to the bones of the torso and the skull being very degraded. But whereas the legs here are actually in very good condition. This, pack, this pink sandstone, there are some small fragments throughout the natural gravels across the site. However, not in any sort of quarry, nothing that would, you'd be able to quarry from. So there must have been a local source nearby, which no one has been able to identify at the minute because the gravels themselves extend about 15, 20 meters deep before you hit any sort of bedrock. So they wouldn't have been quarrying directly from this area, but there must have been a local source. The other kist in this area was, had almost disappeared. It was just had a few fragments of sandstone and a few fragments of bone remaining. Because they were obviously of a slightly different construction, they weren't as deep, and they weren't right next to each other, it's probably assumed that these were two isolated kists that just happened to be in the same location. Cluster B is our larger, um, larger cluster of kists. As you can see, there's 22 of them, just in this area here. And so these, this picture here is an example of these two, just in this area here. They are formed slightly different to that one you saw before because they do have a pink sandstone um, sides to them, but they are also constructed with these larger cobbles as well, which is supporting the edges of the kist. Also, different to the last one. So the last one was also the only one with base stones as well that the air body was laid onto. These ones here are just laid, laid directly onto the gravel themselves. The preservation of the bones themselves have been varied quite widely. As you can see, the legs of this individual are quite well intact. However, it's missing uh, the entire upper portion of the skeleton itself. They were all aligned approximately west-northwest, east-southeast, or east-west, with the heads placed at the west-northwest or west end, um, which is to be expected, so the west end would be up here. They do seem to respect one another, um, because they do appear to form lines, and so and none of them actually intercut one another, so it is expected that there must have been some form of marker on the surface, or they were buried in such close proximity time-wise to each other, but they knew where they were burying them. Um, some of them didn't have any surviving kists remaining, so if you look at these ones over here, 
Um, there's no kists remaining, there's just a few small fragments of bones, so it's been almost entirely um, ploughed away um, because the topsoil in that area was only 20 centimetres deep, so it's quite easily just sort of disappeared. However, a few fragments of bone and the sort of form and the alignment suggest that they probably were, so we've included them in our analysis. So I'll look at um, a couple of outliers. One is 407, which is this one down here. As you can see, it's on a slightly different alignment to all the rest of them. And 402, which is this one over here, in a bit more detail. So going 407 here is different because it's lying northeast, southwest, with a head placed at the southwest end. It was actually the deepest um, one as well of our kiss. However, it also didn't have any um, surviving capping stones. The body itself was just buried deeper. It had been cut into this larger pit here, which obviously predated it. However, there was no material evidence coming from this pit um, to date it, so it could have been early medieval. It could have actually been relating to the Bronze Age sort of settlement on site as well. It wasn't the only one which had um, disturbed an earlier feature. There was um, a few pieces of worked black stone material um, in one of the kiss as well in 402. Um, we haven't done full post -ex analysis on it, but however, it does look prehistoric um, initially. So, and also the previous headland um, kiss that were excavated had disturbed Neolithic and Bronze Age pits, scattering work lithics throughout them. Um, so there's obviously um, continuous occupation on the site, but not actual occupation, sorry. There's occupation and then there's early reuse, but only as a burial site. Uh, Grey 402 was another outlier because although it was aligned the same as the rest of them, the head was actually placed at the east-southeast end, which is unusual for an early med uh, long kissed. Um, but it was constructed in the exact same manner, as you can see um, in this light, they don't look as pink, but they, this is the pink sandstone. Um, and there's also some cobblestones as well, which are supporting the edges of it. Um, another interesting grave that we identified was grave 383. As you can see, the preservation of this one, there's only two small um, areas of stone here and here, which marked where the kist actually was. And there's only fragments of the torso and the head remaining and a few bits of the pelvis. But it was interesting as it was the only grave itself to contain any sort of grave goods um, in the form of two small iron bars, which are here to the left, which are possible fittings or they've been, at the minute we're thinking of possibly shroud pins or something like that associated, but with early medieval uh, kists, you don't normally expect to have grave goods anyway, so this is quite interesting. Across the rest of the site and across all the other phases, there's been no other um, dated features from the early medieval period in terms of structures or any sort of settlement. So we're not actually sure where the settlement was for these people. There's three more phases to go over quarry sites, so we may come across them in the future. And lastly, um, just quickly, there was a single cremation pit just found up here. So these are the graves here and here. So this was just found right to the north. It was just isolated and very, very plow but there's clear burnt bone throughout it. And it was very, very small. Um, it's not known at the minute if it's human or animal. However, a very similar feature was dug in 2006, and it was radiocarbonated to the Neolithic period, so it is Neolithic activity on the site. Um, that was actually identified to be an animal commission as well. So it's a very quick run-through of what we found so far, and obviously you are waiting on post-excavation analysis, and a publication will come out next year. So thank you for listening. Any questions?